morning, you're very welcome to the Women's Rugby Pod, the third and final instalment this week as we look across the pools. This pool pod C, no birth, she's on a flight somewhere around the world. So we've drafted in a World Cup winning captain, Katie Dana McLean. Good morning, Katie. How are you? How are the excitement levels? Literally hours now away from the start of the World Cup. Good morning. Yeah, very excited. I think, you know, we've been waiting what, four, nearly five years now for this. Um, so the fact that we are literally in touch and distance is very exciting. You know, as a player, this was kind of the bit where the nerves were probably at the most when you're literally just at the start line. You're ready for the tournament to kick off. You can't really do anything else. But you're, you're kind of just in that limbo waiting. First team is about to be named. It's it's a pretty exciting time. And, and definitely as a, a fan, I'm starting to feel that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take you through the fixtures from uh, Pool C then. The pool, of course, contains the Red Roses. It contains France. It contains South Africa and, of course, Fiji. The opening fixtures, it's the opening game, isn't it? South Africa against France, 2.15 in the morning for UK viewers, followed by Fiji against England at 4.45. Both of those games are from Eden Park, where we hear just... 35 plus thousand tickets and it's going up all the time plenty of uh, fans down there and yet new zealand seem to be completely and utterly embracing it take us into do you remember what it was like a couple of days out from the opening of a of a world cup uh, yeah i mean i mean it was a long time ago 2017 a lot's gone on just a bit where now like we can't do any more in terms of your preparation kind of everything that has been done in terms of your training is done and it, it now is just a kind of a bit of confidence you know there'll be some form of like contact session that you'll have to get through and that for me was kind of the the, the last big hurdle once you've you've done that contact session you're generally touch word pretty safe to get going into the world cup um but it was just excitement and, and really nervous i think it's probably the bit where like the nerves are at the, for me were at the, the highest there was you just want to get going you want to get playing you've been thinking about it for a long time and, and kind of kick this tournament on at that training ground, that lovely little club down that track, beautiful tree line, wasn't it? Um, lovely little ground down there um, when other people hadn't moved in um, to share the space. What what were your messages to, to the team in these, in these last um, couple of days? It was all just about like confidence and clarity. Like this tournament will be different for the girls because of the, the, um, how long they are between games. But for us, back in 2014, there was like a four-day turnaround. So you basically, before you started, almost like everybody needs to be on message because once the tournament was kind of up and ready and you were playing, you weren't going to have a lot of time, a lot of training time to really start to kind of make any changes, whereas this will be very different because actually they've got a lot more time. But for me, yeah, it was just about confidence, clarity, making sure you knew your role, you knew your message, you knew your kind of how the team was going to be playing, especially going into the first game, because that's where you set your marker down as well. And in England, certainly, we want to do that against Fiji. Did you miss it? Oh, I said that to Scazzy the other day. I was like, actually, I do. Like, watching the documentary, seeing, obviously, all the girls, kind of their social media um, and all the kind of hype at home around the World Cup. Yeah, I do miss it a little bit. Um, but I, I definitely wouldn't have wanted to do some of the sessions that they did. So it was all for the best. No, absolutely. You say uh, scazzy uh, there. Um, listeners who don't know, might be under a rugby rock or something. Uh, Emily Scarrett, MBE. Um, how's she? Yeah, good. I think they, they've settled nicely into Auckland life. You know, they stayed in the same place we stayed in in 2017 in Auckland. So, a really lovely hotel, well looked after, kind of um, a good coffee shops around in it, uh, which is essential. Uh, but no, good. And I think for the girls, just really excited to, to get started. Like we say, it has been a long time coming. Um, and what an opener, Fiji, on Saturday morning. We're recording this Wednesday lunchtime. South Africa, France teams out, but not England, Fiji just yet. But the thing that's coming across to, to me, and we, we, we judge a lot of stuff from what we see on social media, as sad as that is, and it, and it truly grates me, but it just seems to be a lot of joy, a lot of excitement, a lot of smiles going on. They've done the hard work. Selection is, is done and dusted. They, they, they seem to be uh, in a good place because every single bit of pressure, I mean, it, everywhere you read, it is England's to lose. Is, is that your view as well? 
Yeah, I think so. But I wonder whether being in New Zealand really helps that, you know, because of the time difference. The girls aren't having to live and breathe that every day. Kind of got a bit of a choice. Um, It's not constantly in their face if you were in Europe and you're on the same time zone. So I think for me, I think that's probably quite a nice thing for those girls that actually they, they probably miss a lot of, like you say, all this pressure and the coverage about, well, actually it is England's to lose. And, and I think, to be honest, they've, they're in such a good place. You know, you look at 25 game win street, you look at the availability of players, um, the warm up games. There's a lot to take confidence from. And, and I think come Saturday, once the kind of, it won't be perfect on Saturday. And, and hopefully I think they will have discussed that, but it'll be a step in the right direction to really kind of getting towards the business end of the, of the tour this is a new format so like we've talked about they've now got a week between games so realistically it is that if injury allows he could pick the same team every week and they should be pretty fresh because it would be a normal other than obviously the intensity of international rugby but they've been training that intensity for a long period now he could go with that same group for each game I mean there's a squad of 32 to start off with but I mean that doesn't mean that everybody in that 32 will play and I think that's that'll be really interesting from England's perspective is how you manage that because six weeks, if you're not playing any rugby and you're training day in, day out, is a long time. Whether we'll see a bit more rotation against South Africa, but then again, South Africa is before you hit your quarters. So do you kind of want that consistency of performance and team? And, and we know for the, the warm-up games, uh, there was a lot of rotation between USA and Wales. He'll want some, he'll want some consistency there. What would you do as a... a, a... Oh, it's a coach. Oh, you, yeah, you are. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I think you, you probably want to build, don't you? You, you? He'll know what his strongest 15 and what his strongest 23 is roughly. And I'm sure there's some people there who potentially will su- either surprise them in the warm-up games or will start to be surprised them in training. And it's just making sure you've got a good balance. I, I personally think we won't see massive rotations in terms of the 23, 25 views. I think you might see them in the 15s. So you might see your seven, eight changes that we're used to with, with mids and six nations. But it wouldn't surprise me if you don't see a whole a whole host of it. And it also wouldn't surprise me if some people didn't play. Wow, OK. Uh, yeah, that, that, that is a, a long time, isn't it? Well, let's get into to, to that game against Fiji. Almost the, the kind of unknown team, aren't they, uh, uh, at this, uh, this World Cup? Uh, although, you know, Hosted Canada for a couple of tests of, of late. The seven siders have been been performing really well, getting to the latter stages um, of the Commonwealth Games and that kind of stuff. Um, what do you make of Fijiana? I think they'll be. I think they'll be a good a good opener for England. You know, we know in terms of how they play, they want to play an offload and high paced game, and um, they're not going to be one for potential potential structure. And I wonder if that's where in, England will go early. They'll go to that set piece, they'll go to that scrum, they'll go to that line out. Because I think that's where they, they know they'll be pretty confident that they'll have the upper hand against Fiji. Um, but for me, I, I hope we see some of the kind of the characteristics that we're familiar with Fiji playing. Offload game, not really being slow and, and defensive, uh, but that kind of coming to life in, in attack. Um, but I think for me, probably the later stages of the game is where England will really run away with it. I think that kind of the consistency of training that they will have had together in relation to where probably Fiji haven't, will be where you'll probably see England's bench come on in and do a lot of damage. Yeah, that's a, it. Could be could be quite a a one sided last half hour, good at thirty five yeah. minutes. Um, but no, you're hugely interested to to see what Fiji do. Of course, the first time they've been at a World Cup, that just files in, doesn't it, with the with the growth of the of the women's game. Um, looking for them. Um, that South Africa game is going to be huge for them, isn't it? I suspect that is the one that they will focus in this pool. Yeah, definitely. And I think it'll also just be that point scored. You know, the way that the pools work in terms of the top two going out will automatically qualify for the three pools. And then you've got two third place spots. Are definitely up to grabs for teams like Fiji because if they can keep, try and keep like England and France close and like you say, get a win against South Africa, that puts them in that mix. Um and, and and hopefully they will be a side that as they go through the tournament, they grow and get better. They get out of that first World Cup mentality because it's a really good opportunity for countries like this to really kind of put a marker, um, a marker in a tournament that they've never had experience of. I I agree, and, and turn it around to to England. I, I as an England fan, I'm I'm pleased that they've got Fiji first because actually, 
you don't quite know what's coming and no doubt the analysts would have, would have done their, no. their their due diligence and what have you but you don't quite know what's happening and there's one little sort of chink not a chink in the army but one area that i would say just needs a little bit of um improving is, is that adaptability on the on the hoof from from england just to change the way that they play and 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 fiji probably more than anyone else in the tournament will give them ability to to have to think a little bit more on the hoof yeah i i agree i think that, like i said at the beginning though i think probably what england will rely on in this game is set piece because i think that's where they will massively have especially driving line out more from five ten fifty meters out i think that's where fiji will really really struggle. We hope that actually they, they've done their homework and they, and they can defend it well. And like you say, it will force England to show a new dimension that maybe we haven't seen from them. Um, but I think on the flip side of it, I'm looking to see Fiji ball in hand. I'm not sure you're going to get this long kick and battle. Uh, and hopefully it'll be more of a, a free flow and expressing running yourself out from 22s. But England, England can, can do that, can't they, Katie? I mean, they could kick their leather off it. Use the likes of Zoe Harris and the Emily Scouts, Holly Aitchison, you know, if, if if they're playing the kind of water, and then just use the power of of that incredibly physical pack with the driving lineouts and all the rest of it, and you do that, you, you you're pretty much in a final. Yeah, I think France will be the the, the the interesting test because that's been the one where probably England's pack has had its most test most testing time against a France a French pack. Um, and it, it'll be interesting to see how, how they set that up. Do England look to do something different just in case France really turn up in that middle game? Have they, have they, and that's my only worry for England. Like we say, I, I think they've been phenomenal. Their ability to have won as many games as they have and the way they're playing is what happens if the things that they've gone to don't work. Have we really developed an, an alternative style of play that will, if we're kind of up against it, we have somewhere else to go? Yeah, I wonder how much of the hand we've seen, um, whether there's some more cards um, up the sleeve there for the playmakers and, and, and Simon Middleton. Uh, for me, um, I think England have the wood on France and reports coming out of France. There's a slight change in the in the structure. Let's move on to, to, to France. Um, a slight change in the structure of the coaches and some bizarre selections from from the squad um we, we want nothing more from france as i think you said on a, on a pod not, not so long ago um i think england beat france before they almost set on the park um but look where are france they've, they've just announced their 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 team to take on south africa no Herme, no ndi no tremoulier what do you make of, of that, that team aside from that it's, it's pretty strong against south africa yeah, it is. I mean, Sands is a start and we know how dangerous she is. I think they've probably just gone to get a little bit of balance, France. And there'll probably be there's some names in there that um, I've not seen before. So they're probably getting these girls some minutes under their belt. And, and potentially they have an opportunity to look at what they might play against England. I think, like we said, there's, there's been some changes in that France side and that will pose England some problems because it, you don't necessarily know what's coming. But I think for France, it'll be fascinating to see if we're going to, the way they play, replicate some of these changes that we've started to hear coming out of their camp are they going to do anything different is it too easy to say we, we you know, you can't really analyze ours because we, we just don't know what's going to going to turn up is, is that lazy journalism oh i think for france what we do know previously is that their error count has been far too high they have an ability to be a side that like could win a world cup and can certainly go to a final but currently, and especially in Six Nations, they were their own worst enemy. The amount of errors they made, ball in hand, and gave in either not capitalising on opportunity or just turning cheap possession away, absolutely killed them. So if France, can, for me, can put that right, and if a new coach and team have come in and said, look, you know, if this is not acceptable, we want to go down this route, I wonder whether we will get a different, a different sense of France. We know they want to play. They know they're very creative. They know they've got a lot of pace out wide. But if you don't have the ball, that pace is 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 no use, really, is it? No, hundred percent. And yeah, you know, they brought in a couple of the the seven stars. Um, Guizou on the on the wing. Not played much fifteens uh, of late. She's been a star for the sevens. That uh, England France game is next Saturday. So week week Saturday on the sixteenth. Just to mark your card at eight in the morning. The only reasonable I'll... time kickoff of game. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say that I think as well with, with the South Africa game, 
South Africa have a decent pack. So again, that will be a good challenge for France in terms of getting a bit of a hit out. So I think ultimately we want to see this free throw game. But as we know in World Cup, a Genwi is settled up front. And especially if the weather in New Zealand is as wet as potentially we've seen for some days, it will be a bit of a, a kind of a, a forward v forward, head on head battle. So I think this opener for, for both England and France will be really good test to see the versions of those teams we're going to get as the tournament goes through. You mentioned South Africa there. Uh, let's hear from the lady who uh, must have some sort of magic rugby wand uh, that she's taken from, well, I was going to say Ireland, but she was living in, in South West London, wasn't she? Um, Lynn Cantwell, the high performance director uh, of South African women's rugby. Uh, I spoke to her a little bit earlier on. I am Sophie De Giddy, and you are listening to the Women's Rugby Pod. It is a very, very, very warm welcome to Lynn Cantwell, basically Mrs. South African Rugby. That's that's basically the title, Mrs. South African Rugby, Women's Rugby. Um, high performance director, manager? Manager. Manager, yeah. high performance manager, South African women. Uh, Lynn Campbell, thank you so much for, for joining us on the WRP. We're trying to get around all the nations um, in this incredibly exciting week, couple of days now until opening kickoff. On a personal level, how are you? Are you enjoying being out there in a World Cup in a tracksuit rather than um, sort of in the playing kit? Yeah, thanks, Johnny. Look, no, I think I think everybody's really excited to be here. Um, I think having the extra week in preparation for the World Cup for COVID reasons, etc., has just allowed every team to settle well, and, and definitely has allowed us to settle well too. Um, I think the the opening ceremony that that New Zealand rugby put on and World Rugby put on was was real was a real treasure, and it was a real testament to I think what they're trying to achieve in this World Cup, and it was very. It's very rugby specific and, and ambitious, but there was an incredible thread of female empowerment through it with some beautiful dancers and some gorgeous poetry that were, you know, were really, really strong and powerful messages around around the the, the possibilities in, in women and, and the women's game. So I think after that, everybody was kind of pumped, you know, as of the last 24 hours, all of the teams are being announced and everybody's getting a true sense of, you know, who is that starting team and um from a rugby point of view, it's probably only up until that stage where you can like truly start analysing who you're going to be playing against and and creating your own kind of tactics and game plans around them. So, yeah, yeah, things are definitely reaching the business end and I think everybody's ready to go. Yeah, I'm sure. How have you been mixing your time between on the field stuff, obviously sort of a bit of uh, sort of getting over the travel and what have you, but, but also it's important to, uh, I'm guessing... No, yes, I, I do. It's important to to enjoy the country and 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 enjoy what New Zealand has to offer. How, how's that balance been been going so far? Yeah, good. Thanks. Look, we we prepared well for for the travel and our jet lag. You know, we've we've been doing a couple of things around that in line with you know previous tours and how did we manage with that. So I think we 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 got over those couple of days well enough. Um, I think having been to a couple of World Cups, I think you know my main. Uh, motivation for our preparation was around how do we how do we prepare the girls and the management to who aren't familiar with World Cup cycles how to, to how to manage yourself I suppose you know practically emotionally um, and and a huge piece of that is trying to compartmentalize what you're trying to do here and have the ability to switch off you know it's an emotional roller coaster once the game starts you're always looking over your shoulder as to what the results are and how you're performing where the injuries are etc um, so it's important to try and stay fresh at an emotional level um, and, and your best preparation for that is, is going into the competition in, in that state. So I think we've been spending the last couple of days. Yesterday, we had a really wonderful trip out to Waiheke Island and we were invited into a local oh. marae, um, which was so wonderful. Um, and at a cultural level, whoa, it just took off. Like there was just sparks everywhere of just shared cultures experiences of all the because we've got seven different languages and seven different cultures in in our team and um, and then it was such a privilege to be invited into a um a marae and I understand more about the Maori culture and uh, there was some beautiful songs exchanged um, and cultures exchanged and stories exchanged which was a wonderful experience so I think the girls came away from it really really energized and um 
And I think it was, a, it was a good shout. So there was a lot of singing today at training and there's a lot of energy and a lot of uh, good things that happen in training. So hopefully that's a good start. I'm, I'm very impressed with your pronunciations as well. Um, very, very good, Lynn. Played 19 since World Cup 2017, one ten. I mean, completely and utterly remodelled the whole thing. We, we've spoken, um, I don't know if you listened to the previous quote, but we actually described you as a, as, a, as a witch or a wizard with this magic wand that you're completely and utterly changing South African um, rugby. But you're coming to this tournament in, in, in unbelievable form. Um, win over Japan, in Japan, series win against Spain. Could the, the squad on the park be in any better state? to hit that, that that opening game against France running? Yeah, look, I think our biggest gift to the girls at this stage is, is, is their confidence, you know, is just making sure that they feel confident in the work that they've done um, and confident in, confidence in themselves. I, I think based on kind of our journey and the age, like the developmental age, I think of this squad and, and the girls, um, there's a huge piece around backing yourself, you know, in this competition. In World Cups, it's always very easy to be sharing a lift with um, with Poppy Cleal or or Marley Packer or Emily Scarrett and suddenly come out the other side of a, of a lift feeling very small, you know, and I think it was important for the girls to, to, <laughs> to really try and focus on, on themselves. So yeah, like like that's our as I mentioned, that's our biggest gift to them. Look, I think the way it is, Johnny, is that like if we had another year, we'd be in a better position. But I think we, we've done our best. We've maximized our time from a COVID point of view. We've we've put some cornerstones in place, you know, but we've definitely not addressed lots of things because we we hadn't got enough time. And um with more time, they would get better. But I, I think for this team and this squad. This World Cup is, is coming at a good time to just get a real understanding of where we are at relative to the world um, and from which we'll build. So, yeah, I think everybody's excited. Uh, they will they, they live lots of potential. They've got some massive talent across the pitch. Um, and yes, that can be refined. But I'm really hoping for the girls to feel confident in, in themselves that they can put that into practice um, and show everybody what they can do. But either way, there's going to be massive learnings. Uh, you know, it must be quite difficult being the competitive beast that, that you are, being you know, the most Captain Ireland player of, of all time and actually managing your expectations. I'm guessing there's quite a moment in your hotel room where, you know, we've got to build slowly and, and do it right and what have you. But it's going to be a wonderful experience, isn't it, for for all the players who've never been to a World Cup before. Um, England, Fiji um, and France. How important is that opening, I'm not even going to say 20 minutes, how is it important is that opening 10 minutes against France in the opening round? Yeah, look, it, it is massive. And for all the reasons I just described, it's important for the girls to kind of bring that confidence onto the pitch. And there's nothing that allows you to say confidence through a game than actually putting it on the pitch and, and, and knowing that it, you can transfer it. Look, I think the big story is what's happening with France. You know, we know that their form has been up and down in the past couple of months. They've had management changes. They've had lots of squad changes as well. And, and nobody knows, you know, as, as a romantic rugby supporter, I, I'm hopeful that, that France demonstrate to us all in the world what, what, what they're capable of. You know, they've come third in three World Cups and I'm sure that hurts an awful lot. Um, so no doubt they, they intend to show the world what they're made of. At the same time, you know, we're we're hoping that they have a wobbly start and, you know, we've looked at their team and there's definitely some some changes there and some lack of experience in certain positions and so on, which which could be um, vulnerable vulnerabilities, but also could be strengths. But for our girls, as I said, it's important that they just focus on 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 themselves, what we're trying to do tactically and where we're trying to play and um, defensively, what we're trying to do in order to not give um, France much opportunity to play. We know that we show up from a physicality point of view and also we know that, that France do too. Um, but you're right, I think that first 10, 15 minutes is just important to absorb what, what happens and um, and try and just put from some form of stability from our point of view on how we're trying to play. What constitutes success for South African women at this World Cup, Lynn? Yeah, look, we, we have an objective goal of, of trying to get out of the pool, of, of, of gathering seven points. We have obviously France first, Fiji second and, and England third. Um, so that goes without saying there, there has to be a win with, with a bonus point and trying to gather two other points from, from two of the other games. Obviously, 
that's dependent on, on other results as well. So that's an objective goal. Um, I, I think for me personally, it's a, there's a piece around performing with distinction. You know, I really want the girls to, to demonstrate what, what they're capable of, what they've been learning um, and, and feel proud of themselves in, in what they do and, and just demonstrate that, that stepping stone. So I think they're, they're the two main goals. I, I think one of the things that we were really trying to evolve strongly this year is, is our analysis component. Um, because if you can, if you can break the game down into its component parts and measure that, you know, you might not get the scoreline that you want, but you might look at your set piece and say, Hey, you know, that was better than the last time or, or let's work on that for the next time, et cetera. And it just allows them to focus on, on those things as opposed to, you know, the outcomes, which I think is really important. And finally, you're a world cup with a clipboard rather than a gum shield. Do you miss it? <laughs> I always said, Johnny, I, um, I always, I never missed it when the teams were playing well. I always felt like I wanted to get on the pitch when they're not. Uh, so there, there's a funny piece there. I don't know. Look, you know, you know how it is as a parent. Like I, I retired and, and probably within two or three years, I, I had my first baby and, and, and family life took off. And I feel so grateful for that. Um, so, yeah, no, I don't. Like I definitely, I still play with the girls. I still we do kind of mini skill sessions, any chance at all that there's a touch game, I'm right in there. Um, but <laughs> I don't think it's, it's I don't think it's me trying to relive anything of the past. You know, we had our time and I was very grateful for that time and what we achieved in that time. But yeah, like yeah, there's always there's always new eras that come through. You've still got it, I bet. You've still got it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm way faster than I actually am though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a gap there. Oh, oh that's closed rather quickly. Um <laughs> Lynn, we will leave there because I know it's late over there and I hugely appreciate your, your time, really do. Um, all the very, very best yeah, from everyone here at WRP uh, uh, for the World Cup and, and the opening game against France. I'm really looking forward to, to calling it. And uh, yeah, lovely to see you. Yeah, thanks, Johnny. Thanks for your support. Great to have Lynn on on the pod, KT. Um, can you quite believe the developments, and not just with the team, but the whole approach to women's rugby, the whole uh, view of it in in a in a very what was a very very male dominated sport in South Africa. No, but I think knowing somebody like Linny, you can't couldn't think of a better person to go and do that. Um, what a, like a great person and all that. The, her enthusiasm for rugby, I can imagine, will have just got as, the amount the changes that have happened because she will have got people on board. You can't not but want to go and help her or go support whatever her vision. And I think that's what you're seeing out of South Africa at the moment is that they've put somebody in there who is extremely talented but also extremely passionate about the women's game and people want to be on board of that. They want to be part of that. And I, I think it's tremendous the amount of work that she's done and, and what she's achieved in such a small time. You know, we've only seen South Africa play a handful of times. And I think they've played more since she's been in charge than the previous 10 years, which is amazing for them, amazing for the country, but more importantly, amazing for, the, for their girls. Yeah, 100%. Um, she's incredibly personal, as, as you heard then. And... I was going to use another phrase, but she, as you say, she she cares, and it, it's a winning combination, especially when you have the the, the talent and the, and the knowledge to back that up. I know Razi Rasmus in the in the background is is very much helping along, just in the wings, and it and it is a a, a full approach from South African rugby to to get women's rugby to to where it is. So their their, their team, hugely hugely physical, um, experienced player, Cindy. I'm not going to use her full name, but Cindy Boy in the second row. She's one of those players that they can just file in behind. Yeah, definitely. And have a, we? I played against them uh, when I played for the Barbarians. So you know they're they're a decent side. Like they're not they're not a poor side. And and I think some of the score lines have been under probably is doesn't really reflect the talent you have. Like you say, they've got a big pack, got some real physical girls that enjoy carrying and, and they've got some halfbacks in there that have been, been around a long time that'll know how to pull the strings with a good kicking game. So I, I think this will be more of a test than potentially people are will say about that South Africa France. But I think it, it comes down to the, the 80 minutes and all people see is that score. I think if you look at it in 
a half or the first 20, first 60 minutes of the game. I think South Africa will will challenge France, but it's whether they can do it for the full 80 minutes. Like We'll find out for Fiji as well. Yeah, we just spoke about Australia um, a couple of pods ago when we were looking at Pule. Embryonic in terms of getting on that first step, but a proper solid foundation step that, that I think obviously Lynn is doing now and I think Australia are, are, are the same. The more time they get together, do you, do you think they're going to really, really grow as this, as this tournament goes on or will they run out of steam physically, mentally? I think the the, step, the, the turnaround will really help these nations. Yeah, 100%. Because the, the squad size, yes, is big, but also just having that amount of time when you need your key players playing regularly allows the recovery time. I know like I struggled by the time we were getting towards the end of the tournament and we were in a position where like a lot of our girls got retained. We didn't play every minute of every game. Whereas you'll have some girls from some countries that literally will play every minute of every game and then they'll be training every day in between. Whereas now that seven day turnaround really helps those nations. So you'd like to hope that by the time you get into the end, nobody's other than the kind of general tournament fatigue everybody will get. It's a bit more of a balanced, more level playing field because they've been able to recover. We can't see an upset, can we? South Africa, France? I don't think so. No, <laughs> I don't think so. I'd, potentially, there is the option in that group. I, I wonder whether like Fiji could be a bit more of a, a bogey side there. But I think probably the opening game is what we'll go to, we'll go to form. So England and France are winning for Katie Day McLean in the opening round of this Pool C. Yes. There you are. You have it here. And you're, we can't well, you go back on that now. It's, it's, it's in print. It's not in print, is it? <laughs> we will leave you to Mother Chip. You're doing some work for BBC Radio 5 Live, I understand, during the tournament. Indeed. Indeed. If anybody want to hear my dulcet tones. No, there will be on ITV. Sorry. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um, no no great stuff we're super super pleased you're, you're involved and we're going to catch up with you later in the tournament as well we do just have to finish out with a, a couple of shout outs though kt um i've got one everyone involved the wooden spoon vets festival featuring our very own vicky alexander it's this saturday um, at Mosley RFC, uh, promises to be a fabulous event. It really does. Um, King off around half past ten and concluding around six o'clock. Perfect way to carry your rugby watching from those early World Cup games. And I've also got one, Johnny. Mine is um, good luck to all those playing in the Rugby 10th Championship over the next two weekends. This weekend in Pretoria and next weekend in Stellenbosch. 25 counties represented. Women, men, boys and girls. Doesn't that sound awesome? It does. I, I know Anna Cap Capeless is going down for it. Did I see Tamara oh, Taylor getting on a, on a flight to go and play in that as well? Oh, very nice. Very nice. What a glutton for punishment. My word. Uh, <laughs> word. Yeah, all, all the best um, to those teams down in South Africa. So just to mark your card one final time. For the opening round of the Rugby World Cup New Zealand 2021 playing in 2022. All starts on Saturday the 8th of October. This Saturday from Pool C. South Africa against France at 2.15. Then Fiji against England at 4.45. And then Australia against the host New Zealand at quarter past seven. All of those three fixtures at Eden Park in Auckland. What uh, an opening salvo that promises to be. And then on the Sunday from Pool B, USA against Italy, 12.45, 0.045 back here in the UK. Japan against Canada, quarter past three. And then a huge Six Nations derby, isn't it? Wales against Scotland at 5.45 from the Northern Events Centre in Whangarei, those three Sunday games. So there we go then, Katie. There we have it. Oh, it's opening round of fixtures. It's like being a six-year-old child on Christmas Eve, isn't it? I'm that excited about it all. Um, enjoy the opening weekend. Thank you so much for your company and taking us through Pool C. Uh, and we'll speak to you very soon. Thank you very much. Have a lovely weekend, everybody. Take care.